you know, that's the traditional model. And I think that model is an outdated model, right? Because um, it's not an engaging experience for students. Students are at different levels. They have different interests. And so my thesis would be the, the role of the teacher is still very important, but the, the job needs to change. Welcome everybody to the Strategy Show. I'm Simon Severino, your host. And our guest today is a three times ed tech startup operator turned angel investor. He believes education will change more in the next 30 years than it has in the last 1000 years. And technology will help enable those changes. So today we will talk technology and growth and sales. Welcome everybody, Graham Foreman. Simon, thanks so much for having me on the show. It's my pleasure to be here. It's so cool to have you here because we have very relevant topics today. We will talk tech companies around growth, sales and marketing. And this is what you have been doing for the last decades with great success. So we can learn so much from you and I'm happy to have you here. What are you currently creating, Graham? Uh, absolutely. So, so after after I did startups for a while, I, I turned to investing and started uh, a micro fund called Edivate Capital. And our current work is uh, backing seed stage, impact focused education entrepreneurs. And th these entrepreneurs serve schools all over the world, but primarily uh, K twelve schools and districts here in the United States. And so. It's, it's patient capital into K-12 ventures that are trying to change the way school works. Uh, the, work, the work is going really well, uh, and this, this has been a, a strong year. Um, I have you know, six or seven companies in the portfolio now that are growing between you know, 2x uh, as much as 7x this year. Uh, and I have a number of others that are going to grow 50, 60, 70 percent this year. And, as uh, many of your listeners may have read, uh, education technology is is very much front and center right now as schools have been forced to go remote and do virtual instruction. And you know, for years there's been a, a shift to digital teaching and learning in our industry. Uh, but because of the the pandemic, it's really been accelerated. I see demand being pulled forward by you know, five years. Or more. So, so this is this is the work that I do today. But I'm also thinking about the supply of capital into education more broadly. Um, you know, venture capital is is which is what I'm doing is very much a, a niche business. Um, you know, investors are looking for for home runs, and they need those home runs in order to return you know three x, which is the target to their to their investors or their limited partners. So it's actually very rational what they do. You know, if you if you have a two hundred fifty million dollar fund, and assuming you own you know ten percent of the companies you back, you need to create five billion dollars in enterprise value to return just twice the money back to your limited partners. Uh, so this this takes bets in companies that'll provide you know outsized returns, right? Ten x or more in just five to seven years. That they need you know billion dollar companies. And for me, though, with my very small fund, you know, I'm successful with $100 million exits, you know, even, even smaller. So in K-12 education, we, we have a finite market of, you know, just 14,000 schools here in the U.S. And, and it's also one that is notoriously slow to, to change. Schools don't, don't innovate very quickly. Generally, in a pandemic, they have to. But in normal times, they don't have to. So and ch and change just takes a long time. It can take several decades. So you know these these timelines don't suit uh, VCs and unicorns are very hard to come by in in our space. So so you know essentially what we need is more patient capital that's flexible and aligned for just longer time frames than the traditional you know five to seven year exit, the ten x return that VCs are looking for, and so. Um, there are a lot of excellent businesses in the space, you know, that can grow to be a hundred million dollar businesses and do so profitably with, with relatively little capital. 
you know, and, and we call these businesses camels uh, because they're really built to last and don't need a ton of capital to be successful. We're fortunate to back a number of those excellent businesses, but there are many others that just simply don't get funded because there's a not enough patient capital available. So what I'm thinking about today is how to create you know, alternative structures for these entrepreneurs who aren't on the traditional venture capital path while also delivering market rate returns to those shareholders. And there are structures that could work. Uh, they include you know, revenue-based financing, which is, which is on the rise, profit sharing or a preferred dividend model that could deliver those market rate returns and, and do it uh, honestly with less volatility than with VC. And best of all, it could increase the supply of capital and catalyze really a whole new generation of impact focused entrepreneurs who are trying to improve our K-12 education system. How does education of the future look like? Yeah, I think I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a futurist, um, but I think what we're seeing is we're seeing um, an acceleration of many trends that are, that are happening in education. I think one of those mega trends is something called blended learning where students are learning both um, on campus, you know, at a school or at a, at a university, but they're also learning um, digitally as, as well, right? And it sort of goes back and forth. There's, there's some hybrid learning going on between digital and, and being in a, in a physical space. So I think, I think that's one trend that's, that's happening. I think another trend that's happening is that, um, Uh, affordability and accessibility uh, is on the rise. We, we talk about democratizing access to, to education and technology because it's, it's now so widely available, you can, you can get online anywhere with a device and internet connection. There are billions of people that have you know, supercomputers in the form of phones now in their pockets. Um, That's creating more accessibility to, to, to education than ever before. There are still a lot of people that aren't online. We need to get them online, but it's more accessible than it's ever been. And affordability as well. There, there are new things, particularly I would say in higher education, new models that are coming out, institutions here in the US like Western Governors uh, University or Arizona State University Online where you can get a, a degree for a fraction of the cost um, and an excellent education compared to you know, some of the traditional, much more expensive uh, brick and mortar schools. So, so those are some of the things that, that we see. I, I think there's one other trend that I see is around uh, just workforce development. Um, gone are the days where you, know, you graduate from high school or college, you take a job, and you work for that company for 40 years until you retire, right? This generation of, of workers um, that are coming into the workforce now, Gen Z, you know, they may have 10, 15, 20 different roles uh, throughout their, their careers. And so how do you prepare an education system that's more nimble and flexible to upskill and reskill those workers as they go from job to job to job, career to career? Um, so I'm hoping, and, and we're starting to see that, uh, more nimble, more agile systems to, uh, to train people from the, time, you know, from the time they're really young all the way through to the time that they retire. You know, they're learning throughout their lifetimes. And, you know, young people are being asked right now, what, what, do you, what is your vision for your future? What do you want to be? And there is this vast majority of people who says, I want to become a YouTuber, which is basically our version uh, of I want to be in Hollywood, right? And so now the number one thing to be is an educator, because what is a YouTuber? You can be an educator, you can be an entertainer or a mix, right? Right. And so they all want to become educators. Do you, do you see this, this a whole generation coming, coming up your alley? Well, I mean, that, that, that gives me hope, Simon, if you say there's a whole generation that wants to become educators, because we, we have a shortage. Here in the US, we actually have a shortage of, of teachers. In yeah, of traditional education. educators. 
of traditional yeah. educators. But let's be honest. Does the world need traditional educators at all? Did we ever need this type of function? You know, I, I, was, I, I was an avid learner. In every school that I was into, I was an avid learner. Just one thing uh, was always broken. The teachers, nobody needs teachers. We, we, we needed knowledge and we needed the chance to apply knowledge and to teach each other, which is now the modern way of teaching. But we never needed teachers. They were just in the way. The good students, they were going out of school, reading the books, coming in and having great, great uh, results. Well, I, I like a little debate, Simon. So I, I think this is this is good. I would say I would say probably what happened was the role that the teacher filled that you had was was not very engaging or very inspiring. And I think that's been a challenge with our system. I mean, traditionally, right, the system has been designed really to teach uh, students in an industrial society. If you picture a factory, right, where you have students in rows in desks and you have a teacher in front who's giving a lecture and teaching the same content in a lecture style to 30 35 students in a classroom you know that's the traditional model and i think that model is an outdated model right because um, it's not an engaging experience for students students are at different levels they have different interests and so my thesis would be the, the role of the teacher is still very important, but the, the job needs to change. It needs to go from, you know, a, the sage on the stage who's doing a lecture and doing a bit of a show to more of a guide on the side. So think of someone as almost like a personal learning coach, someone who's able to, to tap into your interests, who's able to provide some personalized support around the interests, the things that you're trying to work on, projects that you're trying to do, things that light you up, right? And technology can provide, I think, a lot of that content and a lot of the pacing around learning some of those things, but you still want a teacher to be able to ask questions to. That teacher could be online. That teacher doesn't need to be in the classroom, right? That teacher could be a mentor or a coach as opposed to a lecturer in the front. I think there's always gonna be a place for that human contact, that relationship, that interaction, because that, that I don't believe technology alone can sort of inspire and motivate people to want to dig in and to learn more. It takes that human relationship to do that. And, and that's what I think makes teachers so valuable is that inspiration, that motivation, that guide, that question, that challenge, all of that is what makes teachers still valuable. Do you want to make your sales more repeatable and reliable? Do you want to have less volatility and more growth in your revenue per month? At Strategy Sprints, we do only one thing, strategy and sprints. Strategy means having more revenue through a better offer. And sprints means having more energy in your team every week. Check out if your ROI is as high as it is for most service-based and online businesses and startups we work with which is over 100%. You can see it in just 15 minutes by going to strategysprints.com slash sales and completing our online exercise to know what your ROI would be with our accelerator program. We are ready to sprint. Are you? I'm curious about who you nominate for this strategy award. So, so you can only pick one person who is, when everybody is zigging, this person is zagging, <laughs> but they are doing the right thing from your point of view. Who is this person? Yeah, so it's Sarah Kearney uh, with the Prime Coalition. And, they, and they've really, uh, she and, and her team have really served as an inspiration to me. So, so what they've done, you know, they pioneered catalytic capital for, for climate solutions. And if you think about climate, sort of prior to climate, uh, pr prior to what Prime was doing, there's a real shortage of aligned early stage, high risk capital for these big bet uh, technologies that are going to, uh, to help uh, with climate issues. 
And they have a lot of potential for impact, but we're talking about super high risk bets, not a lot of uh, catalytic capital around that. So, and I mean, they, they just weren't raising capital. So now Prime comes in and backs these promising early climate solutions and they support them through high risk early phases of development and go to market. And with their support, a number of ventures that otherwise wouldn't have been funded have now gotten funded by more traditional venture and, and have, they're now over the hump and, and they're on their way to, to scale. So, so they've changed investment in climate solutions and they've been an inspiration to us as we're exploring, you know, sort of alternative structures and new ways to provide patient capital for solutions in education and K-12. Beautiful. This is so important right now. And um, what were some, some books that inspired you recently? Well, I, I've been listening more than I've been reading lately, to, to be honest. Um, trying to, uh, th again, think about uh, alternative capital um, uh, and, and other ways to, to, to fund entrepreneurs who need f uh, uh, funding. So a couple of resources I, I, I've been listening to. I, I love the, the Andreessen Horowitz podcasts, uh, all topics around uh, startups, SaaS, technology, innovation. I mean, they really cover, cover the gamut uh, with some incredibly, incredibly bright people. Um, I'm also a fan of the 20 Minute VC, um, which again, tackles all sorts of topics around venture and, and uh, alternative asset class uh, investing. So I'd recommend those to anybody who's interested in growth, you know, SaaS, startups, software, and, and venture capital. Beautiful. And can we unpack your whole experience with growth and sales for tech companies? Where, what's your experience? What do you see coming? Yeah, what, what would you like to know? So the audience here is CEOs of small and medium companies in every industry in 117 countries. And they are right now in a pandemic with either a supplier who have shortages uh, or, or their clients who have shortages or they themselves have shortages. They need to reinvent and to adapt and shift. And they are all concerned with growth. Some of them are growing too much and most of them are need to reconsider their offer in order to grow and survive this year. Yeah, I think, I think uh, that resonates with me, Simon. I think um, in our space, we have a number of early stage entrepreneurs uh, who are, you know, they're, they're still looking for product market fit at the, at the very early stage, right? And one of the things that I've been thinking about is, is there's, there's no doubt that um, it's important to figure out you know, product market fit early on in the life of a venture. But I think what this leaves out is the importance of the marketing and sales motion for the startup and, and how important that is to get alignment early on for that, that motion. So as, as companies are early in product development, I, I sometimes see that marketing and sales motion is an afterthought. You know, the thinking is we'll, we'll build the product now and then we'll figure out the marketing and sales. And so the, the, the next level I think is, and I, this, this I, I listened to on the Andreessen Horowitz podcast is the next level is really product market sales fit, which is defined as when you understand the business value of your product. And so it's marrying the go-to-market model with the product from the very beginning. You know, is it going to be an open source solution? I'm talking about technology. Is it going to be freemium? Is it going to be SaaS? Is it going to be a land and expand model? You know, you engineer the features of the product with that in mind. So I think people who get this obsess, you know, not just about the product or about the technology, but they also obsess about the user as well. And, you know, it's, it's one thing to, uh, you know, build it, amass a whole bunch of users who like the product and then figure out how to monetize. I think it's a whole nother thing to try to figure out that monetization very early on. You know, we've had companies 
that have just built that user base in our space in education and they raised millions or tens of millions of dollars in in venture to build these big user bases only to wait until later to find that sales motion and i i won't name names but i in many cases you know they really struggled to figure out that sales motion you know it was harder it took more time and they burned through a ton of capital in the process to do that so so in phase one you know figure out what the pain is and my view is that you start that figuring out that sales motion from day one that doesn't mean you have to sell a lot it just means running early experiments doing a b tests to start figuring out that formula, right? So at phase one, if we look at sort of that zero dollars to about a million dollars, it's figuring out that product market fit, building the product with a sales motion in mind. And that sales motion, it's it's up to that early team, to that founding team to do that. And then at say one million to 10 million, it's refining that go to market and then scaling it with a team. At that point, there are other people in the business that are that are really following that recipe to to scale that. This, you know, if I can resonate so much with that. We have a ninety day coaching program where we we help founders, business owners double their revenue in ninety days right now. And one of the main things that we have to do because usually they are in love with their product because it's your baby. You're in love with it, and you're you're great at building it, at coding it, etc. So you're building all the time. And everything else is like a distraction. Why should I do that? So the, the world will see that it's beautiful. So we help them very early get the message across. Tell it like you would tell to your children. Okay, how do you explain this to your children? And, uh, and it's hilarious and, and it's really helpful because everybody had this stage. I remember Slack at the beginning wonderful product but nobody was getting it what is this thing and then the real breakthrough came when they simplified the message they it made click and they said hey you don't need any email anymore in your team oh that's what it is and then the market got it and that was really the point the product was always good it was always okay it was always good enough and it it's, it's about good enough, right? And it will improve every week anyway. But the point where the market gets it is the point where you can state it simply and clearly and in a relevant way. Well, Slack figured out where the pain was. It was around email management and all the files and the attachments and, and all of that. And you know now, now there's a, a massive successful business there. And I think you know the bottom line to me you know, to, to your point, Simon, is, you know, if, if you make it pretty simple and you start figuring out that motion from the get go and you figure that out before you hire a lot of sales and marketing folks that you're going to spend a lot of money on, then, you know, you're, you're going to get there faster and you're going to have to do it without raising as much capital as well. You're going to yeah, be more capital efficient in the process. Yes, you can de-risk the whole process for everybody because you have more more validation during the so if i if i could go now go back and all the launches that i did that, that were not successful in my first years <laughs> the problem was always that i was thinking too much about the product and not enough about sales and i think this is a maturity level thing where when, when you have launched a couple things a dozen things well then you know that sales is important and then you get it and so now when I launch something, I, I talk about it from day one. I don't even have the product, but I start involving my surrounding in the question, in the journey. And this is the first validation. Is anybody interested? Who has skin in the game? Who's, who's, who's asking me, hey, how is it going? Who wants to be part of it and asks to be an investor or, or part of the team? And so that's my, my earliest signal that I want. And, uh, and I am less afraid of not having the perfect product because I know that there is no perfect product. We will improve it every week, but we need this feedback to know what to improve. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. I mean, I would argue that the, the earlier you can start to sell something, the more you've de-risked the idea and the, the more validation you get. I mean, I, I've had companies 
that have sold things based on a slide deck, even before they built the product itself. The MVP itself was the slide deck. And what that said to the, the entrepreneur, what the customer was saying is, this is a big enough problem and I trust you enough that if you build that, I will pay for that. Well, now the entrepreneurs got paid for development because the, because the customer says, I want that and I'll pay for that. And they also have those co-design and co-creation partners, you know, from the get-go. The customers there, ideally you have a couple of customers. So you have a few different voices that are helping you design the product the right way from the get-go. Um, that, that that's hard to do. It's not easy to do that. It's not easy to find a pain point that's big enough that somebody's going to say, hey, if you build that, I'll pay for that. But if you can get there, then... I think you've de-risked the the idea significantly over you know building it, and then let's let's go out and figure out how to sell it after that. Yeah. So the first part is really story, and and then of course story is not enough. You need also spreadsheet. I always say story and spreadsheet because you need also to show that you are able to execute on that and to really ship it and to really improve it every week based on the feedbacks. Not everybody can do it some some people have to learn it and uh, and there are tools for that and but but the execution part is really what what brings what brings it into into reality right? what is your current growth um, trajectory with the things you are doing and what is what is currently a a a question uh, in your team well, I mean, so so we're a small fund. Um, my real goal is to to be able to scale this work to to be able to fund and back more impact focused uh, entrepreneurs in in K twelve. And so, you know, w w that's why we're thinking about these these alternative structures to backing uh, uh, entrepreneurs uh, because it it doesn't exist in our space. There isn't enough of this. I'll call it sort of patient capital that's that's there that's aligned for the, for the long run. And so, you know, I, I think what we need is we need to, to, to find those partners. Uh, you know, we're, we're a there's a team, there's a small team of us. Uh, we're looking for both, you know, the investors who are interested in a patient capital approach as well as uh, entrepreneurs who are on this journey but are but are not on sort of the traditional VC timeline, or don't want to get on that traditional that traditional path, and all the expectations and demands uh, that are that are there for them. So uh, th those are a couple of things that uh, we're working on today. So if right now somebody is listening and says, "Well, I I am looking for investments actually because I don't know what to do in this funky year uh, with with the surplus." So uh, who should, who, who of them should uh, call you and, and what's, 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 the, what's the story? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm always looking for conversations with entrepreneurs that are trying to solve problems in, in K-12 education um, through technology primarily, right? Because that's, that's what I think can, can scale uh, quickly and significantly. So uh, I would say that my door is open to, to any entrepreneur that's, you know, interested in school, wants to uh, solve a problem in K-12, has an idea, um, and would, would like uh, some advice um, uh, on what to do, right? Uh, always excited to have those kinds of, of conversations with, uh, with entrepreneurs. And, you know, you, people can find me through uh, LinkedIn. They can find me through uh, Twitter. I also write about this stuff on Medium, so there's there's lots of um, free content there available about growth, sales, K twelve, early stage investing. Those are the types of of topics that I write about on Medium. I saw a lot of great articles. People go to Medium and then Graham Foreman. There is a lot of great articles there. And um, what is one thing you recently changed your mind about? <laughs> yeah, I I, uh, I love that question because um, it's it's uh, what what have you been wrong about? And I, I think uh, one of the things that I've thought a lot about lately is is the consumerization of education. And uh, here in the U.S., 
it really it wasn't very strong prior to the to the pandemic. Um, you know, pre pandemic uh, in the U.S., you know, K twelve parents they spend just about three percent on education, three percent. Whereas overseas, in countries in in Asia, as an example, you know, uh, families are spending 30, 35 percent of their income on education. So there's this huge consumer spending uh, disparity. But the the pandemic has has upended this. You know, kids are doing school from home, and parents are working from home right next to their school age kids. So parents are they're seeing what's going on, and they're just much more attuned um as they some as some of them are acting as teachers aides and it support for their kids you know they, they see it much more closely um, so it's made them much more knowledgeable and i think getting a, a close-up look at their uh, kids education has pluses um and, and certainly it has minuses over some of the experiences but but seeing these minuses you know, many parents now are looking for alternatives to remote school to keep kids engaged in learning. And, you know, here in the U.S., as elsewhere, they're forming you know, these pandemic pods, small groups with a teacher or a tutor. Uh, they're hiring tutors. They're finding virtual learning experience and, and they're using new tools uh, for support. So parent spending has, has really shot up and it's supporting firms one here in the us that's is now worldwide is a, is a company called outschool uh that is designed uh, it's it's basically a marketplace for all types of learning experiences simon i think as a kid you would have loved outschool right because you can find anything you want to learn on it and there's a teacher like who's teaching that really interesting topic right in a, in a virtual format and so you know th these types of businesses are just accelerating at such a rapid pace because parents are spending more and they're looking for just alternatives to keep their kids engaged and keep their kids learning. Absolutely, yes. I, I also love YouTube, the place we are talking on right now because of this. And, and sometimes I think if my two boys really decide like I will never go to school, I, 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 I'm not that afraid. But if they say, uh, I'm, I don't know where to find learning or I'm not interested in learning, then I would panic, of course. Uh, but there is, even, even if schools were locked down, there is so much education out there. And the challenge is, can we be a good role model? Can we teach how to find the, the relevant from the irrelevant, how to filter all that is there and i think this is this is the main role of education and also to learn cooperation yeah i, I would i would say schools have other important roles to um, um socialization it's where kids get the most socialization that that social emotional learning component for many kids here in the us it's where they get nutrition as well uh, it's it's also a, a safe place for them to go but to your point today there are more options um, more ways to get access to, to education than and ever before. And it's a, it's a really exciting time, I think, to, to be a student because you can find whatever you're interested. You can find it on YouTube. You can find it on OutSchool. You can find it on other places and you can learn about that. And you, you can find others that are interested in learning about the same thing through these online communities. So cool to have you here, Graham. Who should be my next guest? Well, I'm going to I'm going to recommend somebody I've known for a long, long time. And, and I would say this, Simon, if you're interested in taking a deeper dive into the world of education technology and what's happening in education, I don't think there's anybody better than uh, Carl Rectanus. So Carl is he's one of the entrepreneurs in my portfolio. Um, in fact, we were former startup buddies. Our first startup, we worked together. So I've known him a long time. Carl is the founder and CEO of Learn Platform. And what Learn Platform is doing is it's it's helping schools, teachers, uh, students really organize all the education technology that's out there and make the most of all the technology that's there. So uh, it helps them understand usage, what's being used. It helps them understand engagement. It helps them even understand what's effective, what tools are actually working to help drive uh, student outcomes. And so Carl sort of sits in the middle of this education technology 
universe, if you will. Thousands and thousands of tools get evaluated uh, on the Learn platform system. And um, I think he, he's, he's, he's a great guy. I think he'd be a great guy to have on. Amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Graham. And keep rolling. Keep doing the good stuff. Thanks, Simon. I, I really enjoyed your show today. I really appreciate it. We all know that working in sprints is better, but how do we know what we should work on? You're in luck because we have a 15 minute exercise that will give you complete clarity on where to take your project next. Go to strategysprints.com slash sales to complete our short exercise and meet one-on-one -on -one with an expert sprint coach to identify your number one bottleneck. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed that episode of The Strategy Show. Make sure to like this video below and subscribe so that you can stay up to date with every episode of The Strategy Show. Get daily CEO tips from CEOs for CEOs.